Well, good morning. I am excited to be able to speak to you guys this morning. And I do want to just say this is the United Sunday. So I know my Grayson people are here and we are here to just celebrate and to just just worship together as one family and, and have a family online to be able to connect with us. We are so happy that you are here. If this is your first time, we do want to say welcome. But we want to just, let's just give God some praise that we are able to worship together as one family in this place today. We believe that God is going to do great things. We believe that God is using all of us to help reach this region, to transform, to transform our families, to transform our relationships, and to just transform this world and this region. So we're excited that you have joined us today. Today I'm kicking off the series. We are talking all about love. Let's dive into it. Let's dive into it. To start things off, we are going to be looking at how do we define love? How do we define love? And to answer this question, we're going to ask two questions. Number one, go ahead and ask, what are things that you love? Let's get connected. What are some things that you love? I know we're in Moorhead, Kentucky. Who loves some Hibachi Express? Come on now. There we go. Who would have thought, right? Out of a gas station? No way. So good. Now, for all you people in Grace and Olive Hill, you know, you know what I'm about to say. Who loves some Trace Hermanos? Come on now. I, I pray, Moorhead, that you get to experience a Mexican restaurant like Trace Hermanos one day, but until then, you're just gonna have to make the drive. I'm sorry, but well, well worth it. And then this one's personal for me. Any donut fans in here? Come on now, where's my donut friends? Come on, yeah, yeah. As you can tell, food, 100% of the love language. Sweets, you get me going, you get me started, uh, get me cooking them, whatever it may be. But these are just some things that we love. You may say that you love someone, maybe your family, your friends, your kids, your spouse, your grandparents. You see, we all have this great connection because we all love something. And then you gotta ask the second question, why do you love it? Why do you love it? Why do we love Trace Hermanos? Why do we love some Hibachi Express? Why do you love your parents? Why do you love your kids? Why do you love your spouse? And we believe that through those two questions, we can begin to unravel what the definition of love is, or at least how we perceive love. You see, what we begin to learn whenever we ask those two questions is that we define love based on two things. The first one is our feelings. So we have a strong feeling towards that person, towards that thing. It's passion. It's butterflies. It's a warm, cozy feeling as the hot donut goes down and finds its home and just rests there for a little bit. Can I get an amen? It's those things. It's those feelings that you can just feel in your bones. Like, And not everything makes you feel that way. Not everything makes you feel that type of feeling. So that person or thing brings about a feeling inside of you that other things or people simply do not. And then the second thing is that it satisfies a desire within you or a great want that you have. You love because they dot, dot, dot. Or you love it because dot, dot, dot. Fill in the blank. You can begin to make those connections of why that you love something. And then over time, you will find consistent emotions in the same direction lead you to uttering these three powerful words. I love you. And I can remember one of the first times I told Emily that I love her. Now, if you know me, me and Emily have been together for a long time, going on almost 15 years uh, this week, March 9th, 2007, I asked Emily to be my girlfriend, and then we thought we were cool kids because we waited three months before we said I love you instead of just one week, if you know what I mean. That was the eighth grade freshman. She is older. Yeah, I know. She is a little bit older, but I can remember hiding in my parents' bathroom, talking on the phone, and we have been dating for a while, not texting, nothing like that, but literally on the phone. Thank goodness it wasn't connected, you know, with a rope, uh, but it had, it was cordless. Oh, that was crazy. And I remember saying, Emily, 
I love you. It's crazy, isn't it? 15 years old. And then if you look at how we have, how our love has transformed over 15 years, I would guarantee you say, my wife now, uh, Emily, we got married in 2015, been together for 15 years, and I guarantee you that you, she would define love very differently than what we did whenever we were in 2007. We've experienced life. We've changed, uh, changed our meaning. We've just been able to experience life together. And what you find is that your definition of love can change. But I asked her the other night, I said, Emily, why do you love me? Why do you love me? And then you can dive in. Emily, is it the way that I make you feel? And whenever we automatically go to that answer, if you asked her probably three nights ago, you probably answer say, no, because I was stupid and just, you know how we are as guys. We just screw up. We say things that are hurtful or we don't do things that we should do. Uh, then I could ask her, I say, Emily, do you love me because of the things that I do for you? And if you were to go to our house right now, you would find that our kitchen, uh, our kitchen sink specifically, that is Emily's love language, 100%. A clean kitchen is just a warm, fuzzy heart, you know, lots of feelings of love. But right now, you'll probably see that I may not love my wife very much. There's lots of dishes still hanging there. I made a mess. So how do we define love? What's the problem with defining love in that way, based on our feelings or based on our actions? And what we find is that whenever we define love in this way, love can be very cheap. Our actions can be very cheap. Our feelings can be very cheap because I don't always make Emily feel loved. And I don't always treat Emily the way that she should be treated. And so whenever I was studying for this, what we really find within our definition of love is that our love is me-centered. Our love is me-focused. And you can go back to all the reasons why you love something or someone. And whenever, you, it's ba and whenever you ask the question, why do you love something or someone? It's based on the way that I feel or it's based on the way how I am treated. At its roots, our feelings are selfish. At its roots, our actions are so often selfish I can say that my wife makes me feel a certain way, but what happens when the feelings fade? What about when the values clash? What about when views begin to collide? What happens with our love? And what happens when your expectations and the actions don't match? What are we supposed to do with our definition of love? And Fiddler on the Roof, Goldie, Goldie is asked whether or not she loves him after a quarter of a century of marriage. Her wry answer, is exactly on point. She says, for 25 years, I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned the house, given you children, milked your cow. She asked then, if that's not love, what is? Can I get an amen to all the wives in the room? Come on now. So it depends. You can see, you can look at our feelings and our actions. They can be deceitful. And this is oftentimes why we get love wrong. This is why your marriage is struggling. This is why your friendships are struggling. This is why our cities are struggling. We have defined love based on feelings and actions that are me-centered. How we feel or how we are treated. So we all know we have experienced this type of love. The Webster Dictionary types of love that says it's a profoundly tender, passionate affection for another person or a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection as for a parent, a child, or a friend. But how does this definition of love, how does this definition, our definition, compare to the definition found in Scripture? How does it compare? And what we really find is that there is a connection that can be made, but then there's also great differences in our definition. And to look for the definition, we're gonna to go to 1 John 4, 10. And if you got your phones, if you got your Bible, go ahead and join me there. We're gonna be looking from the NLT. And if you wanna switch it over to, to that version with us, but we're gonna look at how does scripture define love? You can find love defined in a lot of different places, but this is one I believe just, just speaks so profoundly to what it means to truly love. And it says, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us 
and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Here it is, black and white. Love equals a cross. This is very different from the dictionary's definition of feelings of affection. This is God in flesh giving his life away to the world. How does this compare and contrast to our own definition of love? And we can find the connection. We can find the connection in those three words. You see, it says this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And in this piece of scripture, what we find is that love is both a noun and a verb. Or another way to put it, love is both a feeling and an action. But the feeling part is passive. It's something that happens to you. But with the action of love, your role is active. It is something that you do. Now, what is important about this connection is that we should not disregard our feelings. Your feelings are real. The feeling of love is not bad. You see, we are emotional beings. The way you feel about your spouse, your friend, your son, your parents, guess what? That is a gift given by God. The emotions that you feel are a gift. And in the same way, we cannot discredit the actions given by many in the name of love. But what we find is that at their roots, their roots are from a different place, from a different place. We see this when we analyze the type of love being used, when we analyze not only the noun, but also the verb. The noun is so important. It says, this is real love. This is real love. Now here's what's wild about the English language is I can say I love Taco Bell and I definitely do. And I can say I love my wife and I just use the same word to express the same type of love for one another. If my wife and Taco Bell are on the same level, we got a problem, don't we? There is no other way to express this type of love in our English language. We just say we love donuts, we love our kids. We love hibachi, we love our mom. You see how this expression of love in our language is oftentimes the same. But whenever we look deeper into scripture, whenever we look at the Greek context, the text, the original text, what we find is that Greek has many different words that they use to express love. And this particular noun is called agape love. Agape love. You've heard of this love before before probably as some sort of brotherly love given to someone. But really we wanna look at what does this agape love mean? It says that this is real love. So what does it mean? You know, this type of love is used over 200 times in the New Testament. It has profound implications and profound impact on the way that we love. But it defines, it says, this is real love, agape love. Well, what does agape love mean? And we find this in the verb. We find this in the verb. The first usage of the verb, not that we loved God. What does this tell us about this kind of love? And this is the first point. If you're writing notes, this is the first thing you want to write down, that real love is unconditional. Real love is unconditional. It is to be received, not earned. It is to be received, not earned. You know, you did nothing. You did absolutely nothing to receive God's love or to earn God's love. You did nothing to earn God's love at all. You just simply get to receive it. And if you believe that you have earned God's love, my friends, we got a problem. Got a problem. For you have freely received it. How does this differ from the way that we love? Oh boy, we could go on and on for this one. I will love you as long as you act how I want you to act. I will love you if you do what I want you to do when I want you to do it. I will love you if you never change. We asked this question to a group of men on Wednesday nights. I've been uh, just with a group of guys. We dive into God's word and and we actually call ourselves a a group of extremely dangerous men. 
And if you were to walk in, you would see we're just a bunch of middle-aged dads that are pretty much overweight. But what we find, there is some muscle in the group. We've learned that. And we have two motorcycles in the group. We're up in the testosterone just a little bit with our men's group. Extremely dangerous. But we ask the question, what are three things that you love? And it's so cool whenever you ask that that question because you find different connections in the same way that we just found that. But we have one guy, KW, he said, man, I love fishing. I said, well, KW, why do you love fishing? He said, I don't know, man. I just love being out in nature, hanging out. You know, it's just peaceful. It's just kind of calm. But I said, how many rods you got? He said, oh, only like four. I'm like, you're lying. You're lying. Anybody who loves fishing has 50 rods and a boat parked out back, right? He's been working on the boat part. But anyways, we got to talking about, Katie, but why do you love fishing? And throughout that night, we were talking about things that we loved. And what we find is that every single one of us loves something passionately with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our body, with all of our mind. We love something in that way. And what's crazy about KW, whenever we start talking about fishing, is that he will spend all night out of the lake. He'll spend all night sitting at a pond. Some of you, I'm preaching to you right now. You And wives, you know I'm really preaching to your husband, so just hang tight. But you'll spend all night sitting in that boat. You'll buy the rods, you'll buy the reels. But here's what is incredible. Whenever you start to look at why KW loves fishing, you know what it doesn't, doesn't matter at all? I won't say at all. But you know what doesn't change his love for it? Whether or not he catches a fish. It's crazy. It's crazy. Fishermen, they could spend all night, all day, sitting by a pond, sitting on a lake, and whether or not they catch a fish or not really doesn't matter. Because you know what they're going to do next weekend? They're going to be in that same boat on the same lake trying to catch a fish. And love is so much the same way. True love is so much the same way. It is real love that is unconditional where they don't place conditions on how we love one another, how we don't love our city. You see, why is it so hard for us to love in this way? And really what it comes down to is we've been hurt, we've been wronged, we disagree, we have other values, we have other wants, we have other desires. And really we put expectations on relationships that really we ourselves couldn't even meet. And oftentimes we put that on other people. It's hard to love unconditionally, but real love is unconditional love. Then we go on to the second usage of the verb, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. What does this tell us about this kind of love? And this is our second point. Real love is self-giving. You know, the word sacrifice alone should allow us to see that love is at its fullest when our own desires are laid down for the sake of another. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Real love is self-giving. It's given 20 minutes to my son to play and to sit and to stop, to slow down. It's giving up your time. It's giving a a $20 bill to a person on the street. It's giving a listening ear to a hurting friend. And this is what is so profound about this real type of love because our own definition is based on our selfish desires. But what we see is that this real love is not selfish, but is selfless. It is self-giving to the other person. And why is it so hard to love in this way? We are selfish. We are selfish. We strive for comfort. We strive for security, even at the cost of others. You see, we don't sacrifice ourselves for others. We sacrifice others for the sake of ourselves. Real love is self-giving. And then the last point that I found throughout this study is that real love is choosing. Real love is choosing. You see, God chose to love us. He chose. Jesus chose to die on the cross for our sins. It is choosing on your own free will to be the servant. And it's choosing over and over and over again. 
why is this so difficult? Why is this so difficult? Because love takes time. It takes time. It takes a commitment to love in the good, to love in the bad, to continually choose to put yourself in the position of the servant. But we don't like that. We would rather be served. That's the problem with our type of love. But that is why it is so hard to do because you have to choose over and over and over again to take the place of the servant. Real agape love is unconditional. It is self-giving and chooses over and over again. How does this definition challenge the way in which we love others? How is it possible to love in this way? Not only is Jesus the example in our verse of what love is, but Jesus' is, Jesus life itself was the example of what real love is. Not only was it the death on the cross, but it was also the way that he lived his life every single day. And we find a profound example of this in John 13, verses 12 through 15. He says, do you understand what I've done for you? Do you understand what I've done for you? And we're just coming in right here at the tail end of it. And you got to set up the story. What is going on? What is happening in John chapter 13? And what we find is that Jesus and his disciples are preparing for the Passover And Jesus and his disciples are sitting around the table. They're eating food. They're having a good time. They're hanging out. And then all of a sudden, the story changes. The story begins to shift. Jesus gets up from his table. He walks over. He takes off his outer garments. He takes off his outer robe. Jesus goes and he grabs a towel. He grabs a basin, and then he grabs a jug of water. And then Jesus walks back to the table and he kneels down in front of James. And the whole time they're looking at this, they're looking and they're watching Jesus and they're thinking, no, no, there's no way. There's no way he's about to do this. See, what's about to happen is Jesus is about to wash the disciples' feet. And what you find with foot washing is that this was not something for the King of Kings or the Lord of Lords to do. This was the job for the lowest servant in the house. And at the time they come in, they'd already had dinner. This should have happened as soon as they walked in. Somebody should have taken the place of this servant to wash their feet. And here sits James. He's like, what do I do? You see, nobody had taken the time. Nobody had done that. Nobody had taken the place of that servant to wash the feet. And you can imagine the anxiety that James is feeling right now. It's like, guys, help me out. What what is going on? What are we doing? What is he doing? Imagine right now if does said, all right, everybody, let's take off our feet or take off our feet. That'd be crazy, wouldn't it? You show me how you do that. And I'll, oh my gosh, take off your shoes. Take off your shoes. Automatically, everybody's anxiety went through the roof because feet are nasty. Could you imagine the smell if everybody's like, okay, sounds good, let's do it. Let's do it. And we're not even talking about shoes and socks here. We're talking about Chaco feet. You know what I'm talking about, Chacos. Just a bunch of sandals, dirt, dust. They smell too. It's incredible. It's all so bad. We got James with his Chaco feet sitting here and Jesus is about to wash them. There's an extreme anxiety that runs up because this is not what Jesus is supposed to do. This is not something that the King of Kings should do. But he sits down before James and he grabs the water. He pours them over his feet. He takes the towel, begins to clean them, take the mud, 
the dust, the waste, all off of his feet. James is still just, I don't know what to say. And then he gets to Peter. And Peter's like, Lord, you ain't washing my feet. There's no way you're washing my feet. That's what we hope we would have responded like, right? And Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you don't belong to me. And then Peter says, Lord, wash me completely. Pour the whole thing over my head and scrub me clean. It's profound though, isn't it? Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, washes Peter's feet. You see, the whole time he's taken, taken the type of real love and he's just expressed it. He chose to grab a towel. He chose to get the water in the jug. He chose to bend down, to take the, the lowest position in the room as the servant. He chose all of this on his free will. He fully and completely gave himself to them in this way sacrificed his status, sacrificed what others would believe, sacrificed what others would think. He didn't care. And then here's where it gets even more profound. He goes to the next person at the table. And the next person at the table is Judas. And he sits before Judas, and at this point, he's already, he's already spoken to the group that one among you is not clean. One among you, your heart is not right. He already knew what Judas was about to do. He already knew it. He knew that he would betray him. He knew that he would be the one. But what'd he do? He grabbed some water took the towel and he cleaned him. He washed his feet. That's unconditional. That's unconditional love at its purest form. Knowing that the man who was going to betray you, knowing that the man that was gonna lead you to the cross was sitting before you and you grab a towel, you grab a water and you wash his feet. You make him clean. You serve him. This is profound. This is why real love is so difficult. But Jesus' life is the example of what real love is. And we see that Jesus steps back up and joins them back at the table after he's washed all the disciples' feet. And he said, Do you call me teach? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And we see that later on in John 13, 34 through 35, he says, so now I am giving you a new commandment to love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You talk about radical love. That is not something that people did. And even now, you're still talking about radical love. This is not something that people want to do. This is not something that people want to give their life to. But it's the new command. It is the command of God to love one another as I have loved you unconditionally, self-giving and choosing over and over again to take that position. Jesus is the example and he has commanded us to love likewise. It's that easy and it's that difficult. You know, my understanding of love was completely changed by the birth of our son. I've got two boys, Asher and August, and I can still remember the day that Asher was born. You know, you prepare for this thing for nine months and then all of a sudden, boom, you're a dad. I'm like, whoa, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, Emily was incredible and 
He had a healthy boy. And, and I can remember the first time holding him. And you're just like, whoa, that's my boy. That's my boy. And you know what's so crazy? I did absolutely nothing to earn my son. You know what my son is? I had a good friend. She said, you know what my children are? And I believe she brought so much wisdom to my life in this. My son is a gift. My son is a gift. And I can remember looking at him and saying, I love you with all of my heart. I can't even explain it. I can't even define it. But then whenever you start to break it down, you know what, Asher, I will love you with everything in me unconditionally, no matter what. You will always be my son. I will always love you. I will always care for you. I will give myself to you. I will make sure that your needs are taken care of, that you're provided for, that you are taken care of for all the days of your life, no matter what it may cost me. No matter if it costs me my pride, my finances, I will always love my son. And I will choose day in and day out to express that love for him. And you know what? That's very easy because he's three. Is there days I want to bust his butt? Yes, absolutely. Most of the time, that's just whenever I'm very impatient. If I can get an amen from all the dads in the room, come on. But we see that this love is unconditional here. But I know right now that sometimes it's hard for you to love those closest to you. It's hard for you to love your kids. It's hard for you to love your neighbor. It's hard for you to love your spouse. It's hard for you to love your coworkers. It's hard for you to love your city. It's hard for you to love your university, the people you work with. This type of love is extremely challenging, but it is perfect. It is perfect love. For you, this love may be more challenging. For every single one of us, this type of love is going to be very challenging at some point in our life because you know what? Maybe the person you, you loved most is now your greatest enemy. So how does this definition challenge the way in which we love others? You see, God doesn't command you to have strong feelings towards your neighbor. He doesn't even command you to like your neighbor. He commands you to love your neighbor. He commands you to love your neighbor. And how? Grab a towel. Grab a towel. Follow in Jesus' example of unconditional, self-giving love and grab a towel. When Asher spills some milk instead of me popping off on him and yelling at him, say, it's okay, son. I got it. Because you know what? I remember doing that a hundred times. I still love you. One of our greatest problems with our way we love others is that we forget the great love that was given to us begin to put the conditions on my son, on my family. Conditions I can't even uphold. Conditions I can't even live through. Maybe it's your coworker that you struggle to love for years now. You know what? Grab a towel. Find a way to be the servant. You know how we transform a city? You know how we do that? We grab a towel. And we take the position of the servant. That's how we transform. That's how we change. When we talk about a united Sunday, you know what my biggest heart is for it? Is that people can see that we are united, that we are together, and that God has provided a foundation for this place for this region and it's called the church then I believe that more than anything that God can do it again in grace in Kentucky and throughout this region that he will provide a foundation on which we can stand to transform your life your family's life and forever change generations to come that's why we unite that's why we come together because we forget what it means to truly love we forget what it means to truly serve a city to allow the Word of God to transform our lives, 
to allow the love that's been given to us to transform those that we connect with and come in contact with. Will they love you back? No. Will they hate you? Maybe. But we believe that this is the type of love, the grab a towel type of love that can transform, that through the Spirit, He can move and He can work. It can change your life and change the life of those around you. It's choosing the position of a servant. And for every single one of us, the towel may look different. It may look different, but you've got to be willing. You've got to be willing to choose the position of a servant. Give yourself even when you don't want to, even when people don't deserve it, and even when their response won't be what you hoped. And it's choosing that love over and over again. See, cross equals a love, a love that's so profound, a love that's so life-changing. But when we compare our definition of love, when we filter our feelings and actions through the agape love found in God's word, you tell me, which type of love is going to change your marriage? You tell me which kind of love will transform your friendships? Which kind of love would transform your family trees? Which type of love would transform your city? And most important, which type of love would transform your life? See, the first step in fully loving others is to experience the true love God has given us. Many of you need to be reminded of that great love. I need to be reminded of it daily, hourly, every minute. A love that will and can completely transform your life. And here's the thing, God has chosen you. He has chosen to love you. And he expressed this great love through his son through the love that he showed by dying on a cross for your sins and my sins, for the forgiveness of all sins. He gave his son Jesus for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Jesus came for you, he died for you, and he got up out of the grave for you. It's unconditional. You can't earn it, you can't bargain for it. You just receive it and you give your life to it. And then you give the same love to others. So how do you do it? How do you do that? For the believers in the room and for everybody in the room, I just ask that you would please just bow your head. And I pray that just for the next few moments that the spirit would begin to reveal in your life those around you, those that you're connected to, those that you need to love fully, unconditionally, give yourself to them and, always, and choose over and over again to do that. Who is that person? I pray that the Spirit would reveal them to you right now in this moment. And then I also pray that the Spirit, if you don't know who Jesus is, that the Spirit would reveal to you your brokenness. He would reveal to you the hurt that maybe you've experienced from the world's type of love. He would reveal to you his great love, his great compassion, his great mercy, and his great grace. He would reveal that to you today. And here's the thing. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to bargain for it. You just have to receive it. And here's how. Here's how. You can declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. You will be forgiven. You will feel this incredible love. And your lips can declare what your heart desires. And so if that's you today, if you want to accept this real love in your life, if you are ready for it to transform you, to transform your relationships, because I promise you, it can. It really can. 
then pray after me. Lord, I need you. Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross for me, that you rose from the grave for me. And Lord, right now, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. I want to put my faith and trust in you. And the best way I know how, I give my life to you. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. Help me then to go and love those who are hard to love. Let me go and love my neighbor. Let me go and pick up a towel every single day and understand the great grace, the great love, the great mercy that was given to me. May I never forget it. May I never lose it. May I always remember the power of this great love in my life that will and has transformed me completely and that I believe that sharing it with others will transform the world around us. This is the great love, church. You could say amen to that. If that's you today, we wanna celebrate with you. We wanna connect with you. We wanna help you on this journey of what it means to experience this love every single day. But I believe, church, that grabbing a towel, living this way, living our lives in this way, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult it is to love people unconditionally, to choose the place of a servant over and over again, I believe that God can do great things in your life and in our city and in our region. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the great love that you have shown us, the great love that you have given us. Lord, may we love fully, may we love deeply, may we feel the emotions and the affections, God. May our actions be pure, may our hearts be pure, not in selfish desires and motives, Lord, but in selfless actions. Choosing to love people unconditionally, giving ourselves to them, and choosing over over again to do that, Lord. We know that it's only through you that we can live a life this way. We can only know through you, God, that others can be changed by this type of love. Lord, we thank you for the time to be able to unite together as one family. And God, we pray that you would help us, Lord, to see where you're working, to see how you can use us, see who is around us, God, that needs to experience this great love. And may we be your hands and feet to do it, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.